Thank you very much for your availability and this opportunity. I want to share my experience at Novara Hospital, near Milan. Over the past decade, we have been actively engaged in performing percutaneous treatments for disc herniations and disc protrusions, primarily within the cervical and lumbar regions. During this period, we have treated an average of 60 to 70 patients annually. Our patient selection process involves a comprehensive evaluation of their clinical presentation, alongside MRI examinations. We employ a specific scale that primarily considers symptomatic indicators to identify suitable candidates. When a patient exhibits movement deficits, our initial approach entails conservative treatment for four to five weeks. If symptoms persist beyond this period, we proceed with percutaneous interventions. Our treatment methodologies encompass a range of techniques, including mechanical interventions, such as the DISCOM system, thermal procedures employing radio frequency, chemical treatments, including ozone therapy, or the application of biologic materials, exemplified by the use of DISCOGL. The best results are typically achieved with patients who present disc bulging or disc protrusion. Disc bulging occurs when there's a slight compression of the annulus fibrosus, but the center of the disc doesn't protrude. Protrusion refers to the extrusion of the annulus fibrosus ring, while the center of the disc remains contained. We sometimes opt to pursue treatment for patients with disc extrusion, but the outcomes are not as favorable, resulting in improvements of around 30 to 40%. In cases of disc sequestration, surgical intervention becomes necessary. Our strategic goal is to lower the intradiscal pressure, thereby reducing nerve root irritation and, consequently, alleviating pain. Our treatment follows a conservative approach, which is the primary consideration for these patients. We offer options such as physiokinesic therapy, laser therapy, or standard physical therapy. In both lumbar and cervical protrusion cases, the following steps constitute the core of our procedure. We conduct all treatments under fluoroscopic guidance. Previously, we utilized CTE guidance or a combination, but our current practice solely employs fluoroscopic guidance. Patient positioning varies, with thoracic hernias being exceptionally rare. Every patient undergoes a short course of antibiotic therapy, administered one hour before the treatment. Our procedures take place in either a surgical theater or an angiographic suite, ensuring comprehensive facilities are at our disposal. We administer local anesthesia and an anesthesiologist is present throughout the procedure. Let's begin with the cervical spine. We treat approximately 30 to 35 patients each year, and this number has been on the rise in recent years. The patient is positioned supine, and we identify the correct vertebra using an anterior-posterior, AP, or lateral-lateral, LL, projection. We assess and align the end plates, ensuring the disc space is optimally prepared. It's crucial to open up the disc space, as this significantly impacts the choice of the appropriate projection. Before commencing the procedure, an essential step is identifying vascular access and, most importantly, avoiding carotid puncture. In the event of a carotid puncture, while not a significant concern due to the slender 21-22G needle, manual compression or local ice can be applied to manage hemorrhage. However, preventing carotid puncture is preferable. We locate the pulsation of the carotid artery using our fingers and gently push the vascular access towards a lateral position. I find this approach to be optimal. A few years ago, I attempted a puncture guided by ultrasound, which proved riskier due to the potential involuntary patient movement of the larynx, leading to an accidental carotid puncture. However, the technique I now employ involves placing a finger over the carotid artery, offering complete control and ensuring a 100% avoidance of puncture. For the cervical approach, we utilize a 19G needle, which has a diameter that is not overly large. The initial step involves administering local anesthesia. As shown in this slide, you can observe the patient's positioning, the puncture site, and the 19G needle from both a lateral and lateral posterior perspective. The goal is to achieve a central position. This procedure is less risky than it might appear, yet it necessitates precise execution to avoid complications. I will now present a case involving a 59-year-old young woman who exhibited significant protrusion along with accompanying symptoms. 
The patient experienced pain in her left arm and discomfort at the base of her neck. Let's examine the MRI scan. In this MRI sequence, you can observe the disc bulging and the protrusion of the left C5 nerve root. In this brief video, the patient is positioned supine as we proceed with the procedure. Initially, we disinfect the base of the neck, followed by the application of a sterile drape to maintain aseptic conditions. This setting is within an angiographic suite. As indicated by the monitor above the operating bed, we identify the correct level for intervention. We start by assessing the lateral view. In this particular case, our target is the C5-C6 level. You can see the specific relevant cervical vertebrae 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. In certain situations, when dealing with lower levels such as C6, C7 or C7, T1, a nurse's assistance may be required to gently push down the patient's shoulder to achieve the optimal image. As illustrated, this is the last level visible in this projection, yet by exerting pressure on the patient's hand to lower the shoulder, visibility can extend to T1 in almost all patients. Moving on to the initial step, local anesthesia is administered. By using my finger, I locate the pulsation of the carotid artery. The anesthesia is light, providing approximately two hours of effective anesthesia. With the vascular access in view, I adjust my positioning as demonstrated here, making slight adjustments to ensure precise administration of the anesthesia. We allow for a 10 minute wait time. The patient's condition is under thorough monitoring. Now, moving on to the next step, we proceed to align the puncture with a 20G needle, depending on the specific procedure requirements. For chemical approaches, a 21-22G needle might be chosen, while mechanical decompression, such as with the DISCOM system, calls for a 19G needle. In certain cases of thermal treatment, a slightly larger needle diameter may be necessary. I locate the carotid artery's pulsation and ensure that it remains under my finger's control. With a lateral view of fluoroscopy, I gently manipulate the vascular axis to the side. In this visual, my finger is shown alongside the needle. This method affords complete control over the vascular axis, allowing for precise needle positioning as we approach the C5-C6 disc. As the needle is initially inserted, a distinct sensation is felt, disc tissue differs in texture from bone, indicating that the correct path has been taken. The angle of needle inclination is approximately 45 degrees, although this can vary based on individual patient characteristics. Flexibility may be necessary. Observe that I'm inserting the needle, notice how I sense the disc's consistency as the needle penetrates. I navigate toward the center of the vertebral body, maintaining contact as an involuntary movement of the larynx could potentially displace the needle. Consistent control throughout the procedure is pivotal. Following this, an anterior-posterior assessment is performed to ascertain proper positioning. In this view, the needle aligns with the vertebra's central body. We confirm this by checking both lateral and anterior-posterior views, thereby confirming the needle's central placement within the vertebra. This process is swift, and each step should be executed meticulously. In my career, I have encountered no complications with this procedure. Once mechanical decompression, as in the case of the DISCOM system, is completed, I proceed to administer a local injection of cortisone, 2 ml, and an anesthetic. The needle is then carefully withdrawn, followed by a slight compression of the neck. The application of local ice concludes the procedure. What complications might arise during a cervical procedure? In my experience, I encountered one complication out of approximately 250 patients, involving a thermal approach with radio frequency. As I mentioned earlier, maintaining control of the needle during puncture is paramount. In this specific case, involving a young woman, I inadvertently lost control of the needle. As I adjusted the projection, the needle shifted and protruded about one centimeter. Fortunately, this resulted solely in an aesthetic concern, without impact on the patient's well-being. I followed up with the patient after six months and the lesion had resolved, and the symptoms had also abated. No other complications have arisen. In the most unfavorable scenarios, we might observe less optimal outcomes. While some patients report a complete disappearance of symptoms, others experience partial persistence. In select cases, we may treat the same disc again after six months or address a different disc. 
During a single procedure, we prefer to treat a maximum of two levels. Beyond that, we are mindful of the procedure's duration and potential complications, thus limiting the intervention to avoid undue lengthiness. How do you control the needle insertion? The process is quite straightforward. You'd find it easier to do so than to describe the procedure. Essentially, you locate the carotid artery's pulsation, slide your finger medially, and gently move the carotid laterally. This step is critical during the initial moments of the procedure, as passing the artery during the puncture can occasionally lead to unintentional vessel dislodgement. In essence, it's about traversing the vessel. While this approach is straightforward and offers a good level of safety by allowing you to visualize the vessel, it doesn't afford complete control. A patient's inadvertent movement can alter vessel positioning, potentially impacting your puncture trajectory. Ensuring the optimal puncture line, which typically involves a 45-degree angle and lateral pressure, is the key. It's a simple technique. The soft tissue that the needle traverses is relatively shallow, around 1 cm to 1.5 cm. This depth can vary, being more manageable in thin patients compared to those who are obese. In the latter case, the challenge arises when attempting to puncture at lower levels. It's important to note that an involuntary carotid puncture needs not cause panic. Applying pressure and using ice for about 5 minutes can address the situation. How can you ensure not to puncture the esophagus? The esophagus lies more posteriorly, as your position is significantly anterior near the larynx. This separation between your location and the esophagus eliminates substantial concerns about accidental puncture. In practice, I prefer to stay to the right of the patient, but the same principles apply whether on the right or left side. Remaining on the right side, I use my left hand to exert lateral pressure on the carotid, then proceed with a puncture at a 45 degree angle. Within just 1 to a maximum of 2 centimeters, though these cases are rare, you reach the anterior aspect of the disc. Notably, the esophagus is positioned more posteriorly. You can confidently navigate without posing a risk to the esophagus by maintaining proper technique. You cannot identify the esophagus during the procedure. The esophagus lies deeper and is less palpable, but patient cooperation, remaining still and calm, is essential. Extending the patient's head aids in facilitating the procedure. Given your anterior position and proper technique, inadvertent esophagus puncture is highly unlikely. If you refer to anatomical understanding, you can visualize the puncture pathway. How can we ensure damage prevention? By maintaining an anterior approach and executing a very superficial puncture, damage risk is minimized. The esophagus lies posterior to the larynx, and as you maintain an anterior position, the needle remains within the epidermis, at a depth of 1 cm. Puncturing the esophagus is improbable. Clarifying further, during the approach, we navigate through soft tissue, which, while not on the surface, remains relatively shallow. You require just one centimeter to reach the target area. During the approach, we navigate between the esophagus and the vessels, proceeding deeper until we reach the spine, ensuring that we stay between the vessels and the esophagus. I carry out the puncture in the middle of the neck at a 45 degree angle, with vessel positioning extending just a centimeter beyond the epidermis. The vertebra is quite close, nearly palpable. Hence, observing the procedure in alignment is important. What are the absolute contraindications of the procedure? Contraindications include hernia migration, protruded hernia and fragmented hernia. Additionally, the typical hernia with protrusion not only of the annulus ring but also of the nucleus, the central part, is considered a borderline contraindication. The best indications are for cases involving bulging and protrusion, primarily affecting the annulus fibrosus. In cases of a striking protrusion of hernia, where both the annulus and the central nucleus protrude, clinical results are less favorable, with an improvement rate of around 40 to 50 percent. There are also other contraindications we must consider, such as coagulopathy and tumors, among others. These will be detailed in the following slides. What constitutes a small or medium protrusion? Can you describe these terms? These are essentially formal classifications, and the distinction lies between protrusion and herniation. Protrusion pertains solely to the annulus fibrosus and doesn't extend beyond that. Herniation, on the other hand, encompasses not only protrusion but also involves the central part of the disc. 
Even in cases where there's a significant extrusion leading to compression of the spine's posterior, such as the bilateral foramen, achieving favorable outcomes can be more challenging compared to focalized herniation. The critical classification is the differentiation between protrusion, which involves only the annulus fiber, and herniation, which includes a protrusion extending into the central part of the disc. If the herniation remains contained, percutaneous procedures like the mechanical approach are viable options. However, in instances of migrated protrusion, the prospects for favorable results are limited. The percutaneous approach offers a significant advantage for patients because it allows for the possibility of subsequent surgical intervention if needed. Conversely, starting with surgery for a protrusion and encountering suboptimal results, particularly due to issues like fibrosis, makes it very challenging to achieve good outcomes with a percutaneous approach. In Italy, very few patients decline the percutaneous approach. The standard protocol involves initial conservative measures, followed by percutaneous interventions for contained herniations. Surgical interventions are reserved for cases involving migrated herniations or severe movement deficits. Do you have MRI pictures after surgery? We conduct a follow-up examination six months post-surgery using MRI. However, it's extremely challenging to discern notable differences. Other approaches involving laminectomy yield macroscopic results. In contrast, the percutaneous approach yields microscopic results, with differences typically amounting to just 1 or 2 millimeters. Nonetheless, this microscopic difference is crucial in preventing nerve root compression. Frequently, you may find that the MRI images at 6 months post-surgery closely resemble the pretreatment resonance. We undertake these follow-up scans primarily to assess the patient's condition and to check for any additional protrusions. What holds paramount importance is the patient's clinical condition. You can see the persistence in many cases of a quite similar herniation but the patient feels good and this is important. I talk with every patient about this, because the first patient came back to me and said but doctor, I've read that the herniation is still present in the imaging and I said, but do you feel good? Yes. Now I prefer to tell the patient in advance, you will see the persistence, but no problem, what's important is how you feel. The occurrence of thoracic herniation is exceedingly rare, in our practice, we've observed approximately half a percent of herniations, with the majority being asymptomatic. Occasionally, we may detect these herniations on resonance imaging, but patients often exhibit no symptoms. However, in a surgical approach, there are notable complications to be aware of. The procedure is performed with the patient in a prone position, as shown in this MRI image of a T78 protrusion. It's explained as a view with a 25 degree rotation, which is the optimal angle for needle access and entry into the vertebra. Staying medial to the costovertebral joint is crucial to avoid puncturing the pleura. I must emphasize that I rarely encounter such patients. This year, I treated only one case involving C71. While it technically falls within the thoracic region, I treated it as a cervical approach with the patient in a supine position. The challenge was reaching this level, and the technician had to apply significant pressure to the patient's shoulder to enable access to the disc. This represents a rare instance of a percutaneous approach at this level, consistent with both our experience and the broader literature. Now, let's shift our focus to a highly treated district, the lumbar region. In this case, you can observe a double level protrusion from L4 to S1, with the disc appearing black and dehydrated. Given the dehydrated state of the disc, mechanical decompression is a preferable choice over thermal decompression, as attempting to remove hydration from such a disc may yield suboptimal clinical results. Notice that the protrusion is located medially, near the root in this case. The fluoroscope is also appropriately positioned and the disc is properly opened up. Identifying the correct level is vital, as exemplified by the Scotty Dog illustration. In my experience, this represents the most effective approach. This is a rotational view of the spine, roughly at the level of the eye of the Scotty Dog. In my opinion, this position, right in front of the eye at the base of the ear, is the optimal location for needle placement. Here, you should insert the needle. The accompanying image depicts a tunnel view of the needle, with the superior articular process of the lower vertebra and the inferior articular process of the superior vertebra clearly visible. This is the needle, but you can only see a point. This represents the correct position. 
As you insert the needle, once you feel the consistency of the disc, you're in the right place. This marks the initial approach, with a 45 degree angle to avoid the nerve root. Then, you proceed further inside, reaching the middle of the vertebra. You verify the placement in the ontero posterior view. The contraindications in compass. Sequestered disc fragments freely floating within the spinal canal, which cannot be treated. Vertebral instability. In some cases, we observe a condition known as spondylolisthesis. Stenosis of the neural foramina or spinal canal, where achieving favorable outcomes is challenging. Infections, including discitis or other untreated infections. Pregnancy. In cases of uncorrected coagulopathy, although the needle is not particularly large, it's advisable to avoid these patients due to legal considerations. There are additional related contraindications such as bleeding diathesis, anticoagulant therapy, severe degenerative disc disease with more than a two-thirds reduction in disc height, and previous interventions on the same disc. If a patient was previously treated with a chemical approach, such as discogla involving alcohol, the disc can become very hard and sclerotic, making it more challenging to treat even with mechanical or thermal approaches. Primary or secondary neoplasms. It's essential to consider the patient's prognosis. Potential complications, as described in the literature, include a variety of issues such as Discitis, although this can often be prevented with antibiotic therapy. Epidural abscess. Dystrophy. Puncture of the dural sac. Hemorrhage. Neurological damage. It's worth noting that the use of very thin needles has reduced the occurrence of these complications, making them quite rare. I previously mentioned a thermal lesion observed in one patient due to the catheter dislocation during radiofrequency. Pneumothorax, for dorsal hernias. Vasovagal crisis, for cervical hernias. Corda equina syndrome. While the literature reports bleeding, infections, and other complications, we have not observed these complications in our practice. Thank you very much. It's not so clear how we can reach the disc in the thoracic spine. How can we put the needle in the middle of the disc? It is indeed a very rare procedure, primarily suitable for the first level. You can perform a technique that's described in the literature. There are some anecdotal cases, and I treated only C71. It involves a posterior approach with intercostal access at a 25 degree angle, staying medial to the articulation to avoid the pleura. However, I believe this approach isn't widely used, and I can't provide more information as my experience is limited to C71. Thank you very much for your interest and your attention.